Hi everyone, so I'm chatting with Kasia, who's one of the experts at TechX on radar and LiDAR research and analysis. Hi Kasia, how are you? Hi Regu, how are you doing? Good to see you. Yeah, you too. Um, right, so for the uninitiated, what is the difference between radar and LiDAR? Well, I mean, radar uses um, electromagnetic waves, uh, in, in usually around the frequency of these days, about 77 to 81 or 81 gigahertz. Uh, whereas LiDAR is in operating in the optical range. So it is you know, operating, depending on the technology, anywhere from 850 nanometers to even short wave infrared. So 15, 50 nanometers. And the two technologies are quite well differentiated, whereas Radar is very insensitive of the weather conditions. It can tolerate different kinds of weather conditions. LiDAR is very sensitive to weather conditions. So when it rains or uh, when the weather changes or when there's a strong fog, <clears throat> it would be strongly affected. On the other so hand... Think, so with, sorry, if we think about autonomous vehicles then, is it going to be a choice between radar and LiDAR or given the strengths and weaknesses, will it be a combination of both, you do you think? Well, as, as things stand today, it would be a combination of both because the two are complementary and none can satisfy all the requirements. So, right. for example, if you need uh, very good angular resolutions to see you know, far ahead so you can uh, control the braking distance of the car, then you have to use a LiDAR because currently the resolution of radars are not good enough for that. But things are changing and there are technologies both technology developments, both on the LiDAR side and the radar side, which I think in the future will very much blur the boundaries between the two. So today you need a fusion of sensors, both radars, multiple radars and, and LiDARs. But in the future, I think it is, it is to some extent an open question. So let's deal with radar first, because that's presumably much more mature. It's been on cars for years and years. What are the main limitations and what are technology developments which are, you know, improving it and merging the boundary with LiDAR systems? Yeah, let me actually show you a, show you a slide here. So, yeah, Raghu, I, I think, as you can see in this slide, the, the mm. radar technology is dramatically changing. If you compare the radar of today and what the radar might look like in the future, there are very, very significant differences. So, first, in terms of the hardware, you know, we started in, in terms of the semiconductor choice, we started some years ago with gallium arsenide based ones. And then perhaps around 2008, 2009, SIGI technology came on board. And now we are at the point where uh, full CMOS or SOI technologies are being implemented. And, and a lot of these are being implemented on very small technology nodes. Uh, so 22 or 28 nanometers, or even some people are going smaller. And I think what that means is that as we transition towards true CMOS or SOI technology, the function integration possibilities on the radar chip itself increase. So whereas in the past you would have had a system composed of many dyes, uh, and then that evolved into many packages, uh, now we are seeing essentially a radar in a chip solution in the sense that you have, even in some cases, the digital signal processing unit embedded inside the same chip as, as the radar itself. So that's one key trend. Another key trend is in terms of increasing the uh, receive and the transmit antenna. So typically you have one transmit, one receive, and then that's been increasing uh, over the years. And people now are talking about very, very large uh, antenna arrays, and that increases the virtual aperture, which in turn increases the resolution. So one of the things that will blare in the future a little bit between LiDAR and radar is that radar is dramatically improving its resolution. Of course, even with some of the big MIMOs, uh, with big antenna arrays, there is a big difference between um, LiDAR and radar still today. Another key trend is we are going towards electronically scanning of uh, radar technology, and there is a lot of overlap between the developments on the 5G side, on the beam forming 5G side, and some of the architectures being developed by yeah. radar companies. But I think the most important is on the software side. I mean, if you look at the radar output today, you have a very sparse uh, data cloud, and you get some information about the velocity and the uh, uh, location and a little bit about the angular resolution. But uh, as, as we go towards these future radars, the point cloud really becomes densified, and that is allowing people to do uh, much, much more um, uh, AI-based uh, approaches. 
So uh, this is one example that I saw recently as I went to a conference, and this was uh, showing as a conference in Berlin in March. This was actually the last conference I attended before the uh, corona situation uh, stopped it. And these guys are just using radar data. They are obtaining fairly, fairly good um, object recognition results. And, and what this means is that the radar can evolve from being a system that just detects and, uh, a presence and gives you some information to a system that can identify an object, classify an object, track an object, and do so much more in the future. And then many people are also trying to fuse radar data with radar data. So a lot in changing, a lot is changing with uh, radar in the automotive mm. sector. So Kasha, radar is coming from the point of view that it's, you know, from my perspective, it's been very mature, um, which means that it's got a fairly low cost base. It's used widely in automotive, but now we see technology improvements to sort of things you've just been showing. LiDAR, on the other hand, is is a new technology. It's expensive. It looks promising. Um, what, what do you see as the pathway for that to uh, mature quickly enough to be competitive you know, with radar? Do you think LiDAR has a strong place? Um, and, and really, how do you see that shakeout happening with radar systems? Well, so I mean, both are necessary today uh, because they're complementary and they don't, you know, they they don't fulfill the same function today. In the future, as we said, it's, it's an open question. I think the 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 real question about, you know, the, the new thing about lidar is a lot of it is about the three D scanning, and that adds a lot of cost to it. But I think one of the challenges that people have with lidar systems is that mm. it's a real decision-making nightmare in the sense that you have so many technology choices. So if you think about it you have to decide what is your principle of operation. Do you go with time of flight or do you go with a frequency modulated continuous wave? Really big differences. Do you go with a you know, 9 or 5 nanometer system, which is compatible with CMOS technology, which is fairly easy, or do you go with a short wave infrared, which has a lot, of, a lot more complexity, but has also a lot of benefit in terms of power consumption, range, and also ability to see through uh, different you know, difficult weather conditions. What kind of a... Uh, 3D scanning mechanism do you use? Do you use a you know, mechanical rotating system? Do you use an optical phase array? Do you use a MEM system? So the technology space is, is very complex. And this is one of the challenges. And as part of our research, I hope you can still see my, uh, uh, my yeah. slides. What we did was we looked at lots and lots of companies and, profile, and, and products and prototypes on the market. And just to you know, show the audience some of the complexity here, uh, you know, what we did was, you know, here you can see the developments of uh, announcements of products segmented by the 3D scanning mechanism. Here you can see some of the clustering by the choice of the wavelength. Is it near infrared? Is it short wave infrared? Is it long wave infrared even? Here you can see some of the clustering again by, by wavelength and also segmented by the scanning technology, by, by range, by, you know, the range of you know, horizontal field of view versus angular field of view, um, resolution, and so on and so forth. So you can see that the, that the um, space is, is very complex in terms of technology choices, in terms of the products which are being offered onto the market. And this is a real, a real uh, uh, decision-making uh, challenge. Mm. And I think the question is, how will the technology evolve, you know, from the status quo today to, you know, the next five years, 10 years, and even, even, even possibly longer? Right. So could I summarize saying there's some, what, 150 companies or so developing LiDAR hardware systems, it, you know, many different options they're pursuing. And still, it's really too early to see which one will be sort of prevalent. But um, but but presumably they all have their niches in some regards. There'll be some of the highest volume ones for the biggest markets, but there may be some of the niche technologies which suit some markets more than others. Uh, to some extent, I think the number of companies are a little bit lower, but I think they're in the range of maybe 80, 80 or so companies, um, just, just when I think about it. And I think the technology will, will go in phases. So I think in the short term, the, the readiest technology is based on mechanical 3D scanning. Right. And a lot of people are using that. I think that the ready technology is based around time of flight and the near infrared. So those are the ones which are closest to the market. But then as you think ahead, I think we're going to see a lot of technology transitions in the coming decade. In the same way that we've seen technology transitions in many, many other uh, semiconductor or electronic device technologies, there will be very important shifts. So I think the LiDAR technology that you see in the long term is going to be very different to the one that you see today. So I think if you think about a, you know, a roadmap, maybe you go from different kinds of mechanical rotation 
and then you go to MEMS, which is a kind of a mechanical rotation, but it's on a on a more miniaturized platform, and then towards other kinds of scanning. And if you think about the operation, maybe you have time of flight today, and that will dominate, and a lot of the ecosystem and the algorithms will get formed around that. But I think in the future there is a lot of merit in uh, full width, uh, in, in frequency mm. modulation, continuous wave, and also short wave infrared systems. So there could be many, many technology transitions, and I think the price will dramatically come down. And the LIDARs that you see, I think most people picture a big, bulky thing. Already, if you look on the market, the products are very, very small compared to the earlier versions. And I think it is one of those industries which will have a very steep and very rapid uh, learning curve. Mm. In the sense, that, you know, uh, the performance uh, cost uh, ratio will dramatically improve. Let's tell me about the, the market. So we hear, you know, a lot about LIDAR in autonomous cars, um, but that also has other challenges. You know, even if the technology is perfect, you've got regulatory issues and so on. Uh, so where are the applications today where you see LIDAR being used or even some of this more advanced radar, you know, beyond the automotive space? Well, so in terms of the radar, I think what will happen mm. is that the content per vehicle of radars will go up. So for example, in a level one or two autonomy and you know, this is ADAS, most people refer to it ADAS, which is mandated by law even in some cases, you need perhaps between one to three radars. As you go towards level three, you might have four to six radars. And then you go to level four and five autonomy, you might have six to 10 radars. So the content, the radar content per car uh, would go up. And to some extent, one could say that the same thing will happen with LIDARs because you know, you might go from a LIDAR that is very large and is giving you a 365 you know, view uh, to LIDARs which have a narrower uh, 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 field of view, but then you can distribute them distribute them around the car. So the content of LIDAR per car may, may, uh, may also uh, go up. So in terms of the applications, I think today for LIDAR, because I mean, you don't need LIDAR for ADAS, but you might, you would mm. need LIDAR from level three uh, autonomy onwards. But I think you will see as you know as you can you know there are some cases already on the market but you know i think a lot of people will try and integrate if the cost allows some kind of a lidar into their cars even when even before mm -hmm. offering uh, full autonomy just in order to accumulate more learning and right. test the system and and, and see the developments uh, for the cars, yes. yeah and beyond cars though are there other applications i mean we would have thought in things like robotics i know that's an area you've covered as well um, it's easier to adopt these technologies, you know, particularly with um, the, the rise of online shopping, and so we need more automated systems. Yeah. Do you see more of all these technologies being actively deployed there? Yeah, I mean, let's let's divide this again into radars and, and, and lidars. For radars, yeah. we are seeing a lot of very low cost, single chip uh, radar solutions. We are very tiny. I mean, you can we can you know maybe six by six or nine by nine millimeter solution, and that is a whole radar and. People mm. are using them for all kinds of applications. For example, uh, human monitoring in a car, or, or you know, they can detect your breathing from afar, or you can monitor persons in, in a in a in a in a, in a, in a, in a care house, in an old person care house, or you could integrate them into drones because they're really lightweight and they give you very accurate uh, velocity information. And so I think that the applications beyond cars are actually uh, very very important. And already there are many many companies out there who are catering to this. Uh, non-automotive applications and you know the, the real magic is here that you have a a single uh, radar solution and you know uh, sometimes even in many cases actually even the antenna is integrated in one chip so you buy one ic right. and it's the whole, it's the whole system uh, right. uh, for uh, lidars i think again the, we should divide them up into two i mean for 2d laser scanning there have already been many many uh, uh, applications and if you think about autonomous mobility mm. outside of cars a, a lot of uh, autonomous robots you know amrs or autonomous forklifts and similar they have multiple 2d laser scanning so there is no 3d uh, laser scanning mechanism it's just a 2d uh, time of flight uh, system and they use it for self-localization and also for a lot of object avoidance so that's that's very popular but the 3d ones because of the cost you know if you need a very high performance long range uh, a reliable system that does 3D scanning. The cost is, is still too high for a lot of uh, a lot of applications. And so I know you've got this in your report. I don't know if you have it to hand, but are you able to um, give us, you know, an idea as to what is the market size for radar and lidar? So is it, you know, by units of revenue, just roughly. I mean, I know the IDTEX report covers that in a huge amount of detail, but 
uh, it'd be helpful just to quantify it. So what, what's the sort of ballpark we're looking at? Hmm. So I think in terms of the radar, I've got the figures in my head roughly. I think in terms of the units, again, I need to look at the exact numbers, but I think we have it about uh, 55 or 60 million units in the automotive sector today. And that will, you know, we actually do very long-term forecast, 20-year forecast. And uh, the reason is because we think a lot of this autonomous development technology will take time. Um, right. and, uh, but I think that could increase by a factor of, uh, if I had it right, I think it could go up to maybe 400 million or so in terms of units, uh, which is which is very, very dramatic. And there are two, as, as we discussed, there are two drivers here. One is that there are more autonomous cars and more ADAS cars on the road, and also the content per car will go up. So you have two uh, multiplication effects. Uh, for the LiDAR ones, for the LiDAR ones, I don't have the figures uh, right now at hand, uh, but what we do offer our customers is we have very detailed market forecasts segmenting the market for autonomous mobility by the level of autonomy. And then we have very detailed market forecast in terms of the uh, LiDAR technology segmented by uh, 3D scanning. And then depending on the LiDAR choice, we have uh, price projections and we have LiDAR content per vehicle, uh, which means that we have very, very detailed both unit number forecasts uh, segmented by the LiDAR type and also uh, revenue forecasts, again, segmented by LiDAR type. Right. And in terms of the value chain, um, who's doing the software for all of this? Is it the same companies developing the hardware? Um, are they working in partnership with others doing the software? It seems to me that software is going to be a critical part to this whole system as well. But say in the automotive space, is that being done more by the car maker or is it much more integrated? I think that's a good question and it's an open question. I think if you look at the value chain, for example, for uh, LiDARs, you have a lot of... Uh, uh, tier two companies developing a, a the technology and some prototype, and I think in many cases they probably have to partner up with a a you know company like a, a you know a tier one supplier uh, to supply into the OEMs. Um, so in order to be able to scale up, um, some companies offer some software, but the software capabilities which are offered by tier two companies are not that complex. But I think a lot of work is happening at the level of tier one companies. A lot of software development companies, so they have cars on the road going around, building up their own internal databases. And at the same time, there are many open data sets out there, you know, easily accessible by the public, which allows a lot of algorithms to be uh, to be formed. And also OEMs are also participating in this in this process. And th this is to some extent an open question because, you know, do you rely, would an OEM uh, rely on the uh, tier ones for the provision of the software or would they view this as a core strategic asset because it not only is, is central to the operation of the car, it is your connection to the customer. Just think of Tesla and it is a, it is a way that you can improve your product experience over time. Again, think of Tesla. And also it really can underpin future business models, you know, going from sales of car, maybe to some other kind of model of shared mobility or some other kind of business model. Mm. And so th that is an open question, but I think a lot of people are, are going, are, are developing it. Interesting. Thanks, Kesha. Yeah. So what, what reports do we have on these topics? We've got one separate on radar, one looking at LIDAR, and that also includes a comparison of the two to some degree. Um, and those are available from the uh, ID TechX website. Um, and so in terms of the research that's being done to, you know, achieve these results in this data, could you give us a brief outline as to uh, what, what you've done to collate all of this? Yeah, so we had uh, we have a team working on it. And uh, actually we have, you know, first let's think a little bit higher level. We look at autonomous mobility as a whole. Uh, we have market forecast for cars, but we also are looking at every other sector. So, for example, autonomous mobility in agriculture and in mining and in other sectors. We are looking at autonomous mobile robots for indoor applications, for example, logistics, uh, retail and other applications. Uh, then we bring our research down to the level of a lot of enabling uh, components. And here we've tried to first mainly focus on perception technologies. Uh, so mainly focusing on LIDAR and radar, but we also have looked into uh, some of the developments on the on the camera side and maybe a, a SWIR sensing side and, you know, and, and other kinds of camera technologies which are interesting. In terms of our uh, perception technology, you know, we've, we've really uh, spoken with a lot of the companies. Our research is led by technologists, and I think this is absolutely crucial here because 
you one needs to really understand uh, the, the the ins and the outs of each uh, lidar, for example, technology, and you one needs to be able to assess what the uh, consequences of each technology choice are in, in the future. Uh, so we've had very good, you know, people with very detailed, very 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 solid technical backgrounds looking at this, and uh, we've gone to many conferences, we've spoken to many people across the value chain, and uh, yeah, and so today we have a portfolio of reports. We have reports on autonomous cars and robo taxis and uh, different kinds of autonomous mobile vehicles and, and robots. And then we have technology focused reports, one on radar and one on LiDAR. Awesome. Thanks so much. And so take a look at the website, idtechx.com, and you can see more details about that, everyone. Thanks very much, Kasha. Cheers.